Welcome to Los Olivos Wine Merchant Cafe, where you not only get to taste uh, Central Coast wine and food, but you actually uh, also get to meet the winemakers. And today we have Chris Curran. Thank you, Sam. Uh, from Curran Winery and uh, Bruno Delfonso. Nice from to be here. They're Bruno and Delfonso Winery, and they also have their joint wine here, which is Delfonso Curran. Okay. So, welcome to Los Olivos Cafe. I know we see you here all the time. I hang out on the patio with you guys, and we, you show me some of your new wines that you just bottled, and we taste that, and we critique that a little bit. But um, to start out, if you had one word to describe your winemaking style, uh, what would it be, Chris? I think uh, flexible would be my, my key point of winemaking in general. Everything is different, and so you can't make it like a cookie cutter style. You have to basically treat every wine differently. And in that you have to be a little bit more flexible when you have different wines come in because we make some very esoteric wines, especially our white wine program. Um, we have these very strange small lot wines. And so you have to treat everyone like its own entity. Right, and every year is different, right? They ripen at different times. Sometimes they come in all together. Sometimes they come in like every couple of weeks. Uh, so it's uh, you got to kind of be flexible to what's what's going on. Absolutely, because some of our wines that we do a larger production of, we actually will have uh, potentially a month difference in harvesting because wow. we want to harvest according to when the grape is ready, and not because we're harvesting this particular wine and we're going to pick it all at once. So it depends on whether it's grown on the hill or grown down in the valley or grown in one vineyard and not another. They all ripen differently. So yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. And Bruno, for you? There's only, for me, there's only one word, and that would be rational. Uh, and the, uh, I, I prefer rational winemaking and thought process. And it's the umbrella under which you have uh, precision, intervention, you have uh, science underneath this rational uh, moniker. And uh, that keeps you light on your feet. It allows you to, um, to uh, identify a train wreck if it's gonna happen <laughs> and then do something about that. Also then allows you to uh, predict the flaws and deal with the flaws, which are always weaving their way into the wines and to address them and eliminate them from the system. So if you keep thinking in a rational way, then you'll be able to handle all these things uh, very precisely. Now, Bruno, you were just telling me that there's something that I didn't know, that this is going to be your 40th year as a professional winemaker? Yes. The 2019 was my 40th vintage. That's incredible. And, and my comeback to you was, did you start making wine when you're like five years old or, yeah, uh, pretty much. you know, with a winery or what? <laughs> no, actually, you know, you know I, started, I started in 1980 at Edna Valley and my first vintage was there. And I believe, I, if I can remember, I was either 26 or 27. That's yeah. crazy. It took me That's a while crazy. to get through college. I'm not that smart. You look very good and very young. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have that going. There's less wrinkles than I do. <laughs> so, I mean, we've known each other, I'd say, since I opened this restaurant, like so 25 did. years 25 ago. 25 years ago. Yep. And we were pouring your wines right off the bat. I remember you had your Pinot Grigio and your... Uh, yeah. your, your Sangiovese, and, um, and we've had your wines forever, and... Um, and we always run into each other where it's on the patio or over here at the bar and the you know, dogs, we, the dogs, and we talk about life and we talk about wines and you always have the new uh, yeah. wine that you just bottled that we taste. So it's it's been a long history uh, between us here at the at the cafe. Well, it's which been, been kind of cool. A, it's been a good relationship. It has it's been. been a re true relationship. Yeah. It has been. Sometimes I'll have a wine question and I go, Bruno, Chris, what do I do if this happens? And then you yeah, have, you have you the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> so. well, we, we love coming here because we're able to bring uh, new wines just out of tank, wines that are still in the process of winemaking, set out on the patio where there's not as much uh, yeah, aromatics and fragrance out there, and actually taste it with food because that's a very important aspect for yes. both of us is what, how a wine actually pairs with food. 
we're not here to just drink wine by itself. We want to enjoy this as part of a meal. So it's very important for us to come out of the winery where you can tend to get a little bit, you, you know, you get a little bit sidetracked in the winery and you get out to a new area, you, you taste some great food, you have some wines and you see what they sort of pair with. Fantastic, and we have great uh, a wine friendly cuisine here, so it, it goes do. perfectly with your wines. Absolutely. And uh, and so Chris, I know you've had um, quite a history as a winemaker, and I know uh, you were the first winemaker at Sea Smoke and got them to be this cult famous wine uh, <laughs> when you were there, and uh, which is fantastic. And uh, tell us a little bit about your history and how you got to this point here. Uh, well, I. Bruno and I are both uh, educated winemakers, so I have a degree in Cal Poly with animal science, and I also have a, my winemaking degree is from Fresno State University. Uh, I was very fortunate to land the assistant winemaking position at Cambria Winery in Santa Maria, uh, right out of school. Uh, from there, I went and started up a little place called Kohler Winery. Then I started up Sea Smoke Cellars and was there for quite a while. And uh, then I left Sea Smoke and went and did a three-year stint at Foley Winery. So, right. and in the meantime, I started uh, my own label, Curran, um, which will be the second wine we taste. And that was started up in 1996, so quite a while ago. Wow. And that was my first professional vintage, was 96, out of college. It's incredible how time flies. Uh, we're old. Go by so <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I think I think you basically put Sea Smoke on the map. You were the winemaker that made this incredible wine that everybody wanted to have, and there wasn't enough of. And we have, it's it's still allocated today that people still try to get it, and there's yeah. just not enough of that wine. It was a it was a good fortunate run for me. Definitely, so, a lot of fun. And Bruno, I remember drinking your Sangiovese and your Pinot Grigio since like 1995 when we opened this place, Something and like uh, yeah. hanging out with you and talking about mm -hmm. wine and. Uh, at that time, you were uh, the winemaker at Sanford, and uh, tell us a little bit about your history and, uh, you know, well, how you got uh, to this point. I'm Cal Poly uh, Soil Science uh, degree, and then UC Davis winemaking. So between us, we have four degrees. So that's why I say we're <laughs> professional winemakers. And uh, started uh, at Inner Valley when it started, 1980, and then moved there. Uh, joined, that's where I met Richard Sanford, and then joined him, 1983, down here in Buellton did that for 25 years, you know, I was a partner there and all the good stuff. And uh, it was an adventure. It was a really true adventure. Uh, that's the only way I can encapsulate it in that one word, you know, that one word. And um, then uh, I was removed from there and uh, not to go back to working for anybody else. I continued my labels. Chris came in, right? She had her labels, so we join the whole deal together and now we have our own facility on Santa Rosa Road. Right, and then of course uh, Sanford uh, Wine Tasting Room was where they had that sideways, uh, sideways thing, <laughs> thing. Then, where they know, film sideways and the thing, tasting yeah. and right. the, that was the gum, right? Are you, are you chewing gum? Are you or? Chewing? That was that first scene uh, in the wine country was at the tasting room. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, well, you had, then you had and the then you had the scene, scene. And the sea smoke scene in here somewhere on one of the tables. Yeah, here. we had the double date scene here. Right? Yeah, 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 that, and then there was a sea smoke label there, and uh, yeah, I mean it, uh, it, it sent this place spinning from have, yes, the whole long, valley. We have a long history together. I know we had quite a connection there all around for sure. We can make Salute. this a four hour. Uh, <laughs> here, what am I drinking? To, 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 well, first of all, it's twenty five years. Twenty five years yeah. being friends. Forty years. Being Salute. Friends. Long yeah, time. Long time. This is a, a Dalfonso Curran uh, Viognier mm. from the Sanford and Benedict Vineyard. And the first thing you'll notice is it's not, its style is not like all, most of the Viogniers you've had. This is a stainless steel wine. It doesn't go through the secondary fermentation. There's no barrels in it. This is the distillation. This, this is the precise way the Viognier tastes. I love it. It's it's crisp. It's got acidity. It's got great flavor. Um, nice job. I mean, I, like I told you before, I hate those big, flabby, you know, yeah. no acidity Viogniers. But so that's why I usually don't drink them. But a, a Viognier like this, with the uh, acidity and the crispness, is just really nice. All so, of our white nice wines that we produce, except for an occasional Chardonnay, which we don't do every year. Um, they're all made in stainless steel tanks, 
no malolactic fermentation is allowed to go through um, because we like that real classic, we, we want you to taste what a wine tastes like. So right now when you're tasting this Viognier, you're not getting this buttery, oaky mm -hmm. kind nope. of stuff. You're tasting what Viognier tastes like, which for me and for a lot of people is this um, apricot -y, um, uh, white peaches, a little bit of floral characteristics, but it is bone dry. The acidity is great because, once again, the acidity is not reduced because of malolactic fermentation. And it's just cr uh, crisp and clean, and it's a great, once again, a great food pairing wine, which is how we want our wines to be. We want them to go with food. We want you to be able to sit down, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, um, or just an aperitif or snack. We want you to be able to enjoy our wines with food. So Be beautiful wine. Nice yeah, shot. Would you. you call it lean and racy? That's what it is. Yeah. Tall. Yeah. And thin. You know. Yeah. Lean and racy. Right. Easy uh, with a white wine. I just don't want a white wine that just kind of knocks me over with you know oaky, mm -hmm. buttery, and just kind of. I want to do that with red a little bit sometimes, mm -hmm. but with a white, I like to be light. Yeah. Have well, nice I city. Think, I think we as as Americans don't eat that way. When we do our Chardonnay, that's in 100% new French oak for about 32 months because it gets less oaky, you have to have it with um, old world kind of old style foods that we used to eat in the 60s, mm -hmm. lobster thermidor, right. um, a lot of cream, a lot of butter. We don't eat like that on a regular basis. It's great for special occasions, but not on a daily basis. Yeah, and this is uh, the Delfonso current label, which is, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, from what I know, fairly new to you guys, right? This is the corroboration of both your names, and how long has this label been? 12, going. 12 years. Which is, was, which is crazy because I, I just didn't know, but I'm glad I do now. It's fantastic because I know the Kern, I know the De Bruno, and, uh, but that's great. Very nice wine. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks, so who makes the decisions? You or Bruno? It's a collaboration for the most <laughs> part. I can't, really, I can't say it's a democracy. Um, you know, we, we sometimes go behind each other's backs a little bit, but yeah. uh, for the most part, he gets his final decision on the De Bruno. I get my final decision on the Curran, if we disagree. Um, and then the D'Alfonso Curran is, uh, you know, for the most part, fortunately, we we agree on our winemaking styles. We have very similar palates, so it's um, it's not too often that we we disagree. All right, good. So tell me about the about winemaking, anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you disagree <laughs> about many other things. <laughs> So uh, now we got the um, the Grenache Blanc, the, the current Grenache, Grenache Blanc. Blanc, and the Grenache Blanc. I've been making producing Grenache Blanc under current since two thousand and three, back when it had not really. There was only one other winery that actually used the term Grenache Blanc, and um, that's a local winery. They only had a quarter of an acre. This uh, first vintage I did was from Camp Four, and. It just, I fell in love with it. Is It is a very strange white wine. It's very large cluster because it is just a color mutation of Grenache. Mm -hmm. And very large cluster, very green grapes. When you press it, it is orange juice. It looks like tang. So it's very strange and it throws you off. But that's all the phenolic compounds that are naturally occurring in this wine. So this wine is a, um, it is much more, it's super fruity, super floral. So you have, once again, these um, peach, you have um, some guava in this wine, and uh, once again, white flowers, a, a lot of white flowers, uh, pakaki from, you know, Hawaiian pakaki. Um, but one, one of the great things about this wine is it pairs really well with spicy foods. So uh, Indian cuisine with just the spices or chilies from Thai cuisine, uh, Mexican food, anything hot, it can pair well with moles, but you know, you go into a Thai restaurant and you say, I want Thai hot, this is the wine for it. And it's a, I, I love it, it's great, it's fruity, but it is dry, so you can't let that fool you, the fruitiness. Yeah, lots of fruit and lots of flavor without being overpowering. Beautiful it, wine. It goes through a second uh, life. Uh, it's good with uh, the Asian foods, right, in the beginning. And then what happens is it starts to age in the bottle for a while, and then it moves into the diesel petrol mm -hmm. um, of like the old Rieslings that you know, mm -hmm. and, and the old Gewürztraminers that you know. And it, it, it then it's 
it doesn't go with the Asians anymore, mm -hmm. right? The Asian foods. Now it'll go with the fatty cheeses, foie gras. It'll go with things more textural, right? Yeah. So it's one of the unusual white wines that has a second life. Right. Yeah. So if you if you like those flavors, those compounds of that diesel-y kind of characteristic of old Rieslings and Germanic wines, I have no idea this is a Spanish varietal. Yeah, we don't know why so it does So I have this. no idea why it goes Germanic after it's been in bottle for a while. But I love to save them. If you have time to save a few and you like that characteristic, it's a great wine to save. I'm still sitting on some 2005s that are tasting absolutely fantastic. Yeah, they age really, they really, really well for white wines. Well. Yeah, they age really yeah. nice. Fantastic. So, uh, and then the third one we have... Bruno? The Dolfonso Curran um, 2017 Pinot Noir Rancho Lavinia, okay. which is in Santa Rita Hills, about a mile and a half further west from Sanford and Benedict. And that is where we have our winery now. We Winery's actually, on that ranch. It's on 2,800 acres. Um, it's all family owned. And we are in a facility there. And it's a great piece of property. Actually, this piece of property that this, this particular vineyard is on, um, this is a bench, uh, a north-facing bench. And this was actually one of the properties that Bob Davids wanted to purchase for a sea smoke. Wow. But, it was, it's owned by a family that's been in the family since 18... 1869. 1869. Wow. It's part of the original uh, Santa Rosa land grant. Wow, without even tasting it, just smelling this wine. Yeah, it's just this got a beautiful is, uh, nose to it. This is what this vineyard gives you uh, within the hands of these two here. And um, hmm. uh, arguably, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's probably the best Pinot you know, Noir vineyard. It's a phenomenal in, in vineyard. Santa, in, for me, in Santa Barbara County. It has the classic the classic Beautiful. Pinot Noir nose. Um, it has sort of those, uh, the dry, dusty blueberries, but it's much, uh, has a little bit more of an elevated kind of the boysenberry, um, raspberry kind of characteristics. And because this is done in oak, obviously, um, it does have a little bit, uh, slightly, uh, a little bit more of that oak influence in it. Uh, but we do do all of our reds in 100% French oak. And, you know, and, and plus it's like Santa Rita Hills, right? So it's mm -hmm. more of this full-bodied mm -hmm. Pinot Noir, just great flavor, yeah. but not without being overbearing. It's just a, you know, very nice wine. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it's great. Actually, we've done sort of some tests on, you know, what Pinot Noir, what, what it goes well with. Obviously, you know, beef and duck and stuff, venison, a lot of game meats. But it, grilling is an amazing thing for um, Pinot Noir. Uh, it tends to go better with grilled meats than with, you know, braised meats. Braised meats, you, you want to bring in something else to it. Mm -hmm. But this is just good with just clean, throw it on the grill, and, and go. Wow. So, cheeseburgers. Could... Cheeseburger, or just cheese, you know, just, just cheese. great with some cheese and some... Well, some kind nuts. of expensive for a cheeseburger. I would, I would tend to go <laughs> to the Santa Barbara... Maybe the Santa Barbara <laughs> County would be your cheeseburger. I wouldn't have it with a cheeseburger, okay. I don't think, but no. uh, definitely with some cheese or some... Uh, <laughs> maybe some lamb racks or something, you know, there just... You, there uh, you go. <laughs> it'd be really nice because it's got enough body Less to kind of lamb. stand up to mm -hmm. that, yeah, you know, absolutely. and it's got that smokiness that would kind of go with it, which is really cool. But well, the great uh, thing about all, the whole portfolio of wines that we make is that we we use a what they call a cross-flow filter. It's the highest piece of technology for filtration to date. To date. And uh, it makes these wines, it, it gets rid of the bottle variation on any wines, it makes them brilliantly clean, and what you get out of the bottle is the wine only. You don't get the uh, the negative influence of uh, residual yeast, bacteria, bacteria and yeast yeah. that, that are in the bottle of wine. But I know a lot of people are in love with this "quote unquote" natural winemaking stuff. Mm -hmm. Probably no, very little that's natural about winemaking if you really thought about it. And that's for an entirely different. That's, yeah, that's a whole different. That, that's <laughs> a, that's <laughs> another whole show that we can talk but, about. But, but, but with this, we 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 remove all those yeasts and what you have actually in your bottle and then in your glass is actually wine and, and that's it and and these are beautiful wines so Bruno and Chris thank you very much
Thanks for joining Thanks for me here. Us. And it's real nice to see you and talk to you. And hopefully and we can do this for another 25 we'll years. <laughs> I'm Ross's problem, and we'll be, keep coming here, and we'll just have a ball here. We'll just, you know, we can, uh, yeah. you know, we'll just we be, you know, wine. we brought wine for yeah, lunch. Yeah, we'll be rolling you in in a wheelchair, and I'll be in one too, I and we can you, be drinking uh, wine together, as right? Long as the rational mind stays together, we're fine. Cheers. Salud. <laughs>